Zenith radio, Zenith AM tube type radio, and the chassis number on this is 5M04. This was made in 1968, and we'll first look at date codes on the tubes. Here's how you can tell when the tubes were made, and since these are Zenith tubes, this is likely when the set was made. The code appears to be 6843, so it was made in 1968. I think that was the last year ever for Zenith tube type radios. The 1885 is an EIA code, and that designates the General Electric tube plant in Owensboro, Kentucky. I think 274 stood for RCA, so the 188 is the EIA maker's code, and the 5 is the plant number. So that's how you can help decipher that information on tubes. Let's look at all the components on here now. We'll start down here. This is the 50C5. This is the audio output tube. We've got the volume control and the switch here. Here is the audio preamplifier and detector tube, the 12AV6. Here's the audio output transformer. Here is the rectifier, the 35W4, which changes AC from the power line into DC for the circuits. We've got the converter tube here and the IF amplifier here. What the converter does is it changes any incoming signal to 455 kilohertz. That way these transformers, which are the interstage IF transformers, you only have to tune them up to 455 kilohertz and they can be set up for best operation at that frequency only. With the older radios, all of the amplifier stages were tuned, like the 1920s radios, and so it was harder to optimize the gain of those stages. We've got the antenna coil here and the variable capacitor here. Let's take a look underneath and uh, see what's uh, down underneath the chassis. Here's the oscillator coil. And this is what uh, works with the incoming signal to make the 455 kilohertz signal. When you mix two signals together, you get both a sum and a difference frequency. But since the IF transformer is tuned to only respond to that difference frequency, that's all it picks up. Even though you get a sum frequency, uh, it's, it's just rejected. Here's a resistor. This is in the uh, oscillator circuit and then a capacitor, and these help well, provide the feedback loop to get the oscillator going. Here's a capacitor, which is a bypass capacitor, and this is used in the automatic volume control circuit. It uh, connects to the low side of the IF transformer. Here are the screen and plate leads, which go to the, uh, which go to the IF amplifier tube, or which go, I guess this is the converter tube up here. I might have misspoke before. Here's a converter tube and uh, here's the IF amplifier tube down here. Here's a cathode bias resistor on the IF amplifier tube. This is your first IF stage. Signal goes out of the converter tube into the IF can and goes down to the IF amplifier and goes through there. And then when it comes out of the IF amplifier it goes to the detector and then also into the audio amplifier portion of that tube. This is an integrated circuit type module which couples between the detector and the uh, audio, first stage audio, and the output tube. And here's a capacitor which I think uh, goes across the, uh, the plate to cathode lead for uh, arc suppression. And then right down here is your cathode bias resistor. It's a pretty puny little resistor. Usually in bigger equipment that's a bigger resistor where you've got fixed bias. Here's your volume control, and there's the variable capacitor control. Down here is a capacitor, and I'm not sure... Oh, this is probably just a uh, noise suppression capacitor. Connects from the uh, rectifier tube to ground. And this is a filter resistor. And here's those bad old electrolytics. And these cardboard electrolytics are nearly 100% bad. And it used to be like 20 years ago or so that if you had a metal can electrolytic in these radios, it would still likely be good. But it's now getting to be where any of these capacitors is at least 40 years old, just about any tube radio. So I just don't mess around with any of them. 
I just replace any old electrolytic capacitor in these old radios because it's not too difficult to do, especially on one like this. And then you don't have to worry about it for another 50 years or so. What we're going to do is we're going to remove this old capacitor and I think what I can do is just cut the metal band on it, solder a terminal strip to the stub that was left in the metal band, and then hook up the wires to the new capacitors. Got here terminal strips. Here's our supplies that we're going to use. Terminal strips and capacitors. We use the uh, we use a 100 microfarad to replace the 60 and a 47 to replace the 20. Now they say you shouldn't get too high on the capacitance that connects right to the rectifier tube because it can be hard on the tube causing too much of a surge when you turn the power on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the uh, cutters and just cut the old band on the capacitor and we'll solder on the terminal strip. We now have the terminal strip soldered to the mounting bracket for the old capacitor. You need to use a soldering station or a fairly hot, uh, fairly high wattage soldering iron to do that. Make sure you get a good connection. We'll also run the black wire, which was the negative terminal of the old capacitor, to that lug for extra, uh, extra good connection. Now this radio is a hot chassis radio the negative lead of the filter capacitor goes right to the chassis. Some other types of transformerless AM tube type radios use an isolation capacitor uh, which goes between the power line uh, common and the chassis. So if the can is insulated from the chassis, you want to make sure to preserve the original hookup or else you could have a shock hazard where the chassis is hot where it shouldn't be. This is designed with plastic uh, shafts and knobs that don't come off so that even if the chassis is connected right to the power line, which it is, uh, there's not a shock hazard from it. So now uh, this is a pretty simple job. Sometimes in other ones you got to do more retrofit work. We're just going to cut the leads from the old capacitor, hook them up to the terminals, and then put on the new capacitors. Now the new electrolytic capacitors are mounted on the terminal strip and the wires are connected. It's now time to put the chassis back into the cabinet and mount it back in. Made sure that the negative leads are going to the uh, to the ground terminal. Okay, everything has been reattached here. Got the knobs on. Here's how the new capacitors mount. I always need to make sure that your physical placement of things like new capacitors is good, that it doesn't interfere with anything. And I've got this hooked up to the isolation transformer and ready to give it a test. Makes sense. Except that I knew other Christians who also trusted, for example, that verse, but their belief system was radically different. I believe in the Trinity. Other Bible believers didn't believe in the Trinity. I believe that baptism was necessary. Other Bible believing bap, uh, believe, uh, Bible believers didn't believe that baptism was necessary. How then could I be sure that I was trusting the Lord completely with my whole? Today, nationwide is on your side. Products under written lighting. Insurance company and affiliate of companies, home office, Columbus, Ohio. Subject to underwriting guidelines, review and approval. Products and discounts not available to all persons in all states. ESPN Radio is your source for Sports Center update. If it's warm, they never really want you to live up there, man, because because of global cooling. <laughs> gets done.